Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Our announcement sheet is out and gives you all the highlights for the coming month. Please be mindful of those on our prayer list and the upcoming events that we have for next month. I want to highlight the Sean Moe's benefit at Lydia Lane's that will be on the 26th of February. Is that in conjunction with the Friends Helping Friends, or that's a separate? That's separate. Okay, but Friends Helping Friends also is? They're just collecting any donations. Okay, all right, so those, so one is ongoing, and then there'll be the signature event on the 26th for, for Sean, as he uh, looks forward to improvements on his health they generate the funds to advance his treatment. The Super Bowl of Caring will take place on February 13th, and there's a little write-up that you might have received on your way in. I just want to share this. Through this mission, young people learn to make a positive difference in the world. They collect money for the Clayton County Food Shelf. Last year, 28 Clayton County area congregations participated in a total sum of $3,487.46 towards this Super Bowl of caring tacklehunger.org. This is uh, an opportunity that we will have on the 13th where we set a bowl or a dish out in the back for free will offerings. Is there anything on the announcement sheet or in our minds that we would like to highlight for today? Anything?
Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time, grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to join together in our opening hymn, number 45. you 
I appoint you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The epistle this morning is from 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I, if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I have nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, or boastful, or arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable and resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoings, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The gospel. This morning the gospel comes to us from Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, hear yourself. And you will say, do you hear in your hometown the things that we heard that you did at Capernaum? And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's own hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. And the Lord blessed the reading of the hearing of the Holy Gospel. Let us pray. Loving and most merciful God, giving you thanks for each day that you give to us, and that we rise and we move through the day at the grace of your blessing. And so for this moment that you have given us, that we might take some time to reflect on your many mercies and the contributions that you've made to our lives, give us a moment that we might just be able to acknowledge you and the opportunities that we have to serve you. May you strengthen us in our resolve that we who would dare to be your witnesses would be consistent and bold in our faith, and that we would carry you with us both in good seasons and in poor seasons, but in all, guide us and strengthen us. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. Bless keep us now and always in your name. Would you be disappointed? If you had learned today, that you might learn, that we have misused the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. This was something that has recently come to my attention, 
as I was reading some commentaries on the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which is a continuation of this text that we've been moving through as Paul is speaking to a community of faith. It's a widely popular passage that has been used in many a wedding, and perhaps that's maybe where you have last heard it read. And why not? It mentions love, and it mentions love is usually the preeminent theme at a wedding. So what's the problem with using 1 Corinthians chapter 13 at the wedding? The problem is, is that reducing this text to the limits of a defining a romantic love distorts Paul's reasons for writing it. The passage follows the previous description of the role of spiritual gifts and the importance of the members of the body. Paul is speaking to a community in crisis. We've seen that as we move through the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, that Paul realized that the Corinthians were getting filled and puffed up on their own ego, and they were starting to compare their abilities with the abilities of others in the congregation, and naturally when you start doing comparisons, you start to say that what you do is more important than what someone else does. And unfortunately, this was starting to hinder and impede the work of the church because Paul wanted it to be a collective. And he wanted all the individuals to see that their gifts all had mutual and equal place in order for the advancement of the case of Christ. So he began to write a very long letter to the Corinthians and telling them, you have it all wrong. You have taken this wonderful, precious measure and message that I've given to you and you've distorted it and you've put human imprint all over it. Now the passage that Carol didn't have this morning because she was reading chapter 13 in its entirety. The, the last verse of chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians says this, But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And that's how Paul concludes the 12th chapter before he moves into what we call the 13th chapter. Paul probably didn't chapter his letters. This is something that biblical scholars did just to make the reading organized. Paul was probably just writing these, these massive scrolls and sending them out, and, and then we cut them up into chapters, probably fragments getting lost from time to time. But what we call the 13th chapter now is Paul's way of demonstrating to this community what the more excellent way is. A careful reading of the 13th chapter immediately dismiss, dismisses it as a must-read for weddings. Now, I'm not saying that I'm never going to recommend this passage for to young couples who like this passage, I'll just give you the straight dope on it and then I'll leave the choice to them. First of all, it begins, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand my body over that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. It's the first opening verses of 1 Corinthians 13. Now Paul speaks about tongues and prophecies and faith as nothing without the binding agent of love. Remember that he's not concerned with the hopes and aspirations of a young couple who are at the beginning of their life together. He's not concerned about what might happen if this or that individual decides to reinvent themselves during the course of their marriage. He's more or less concerned about a community of faith being able to set aside their ego differences and see their way forth into future generations of believers. Because Paul is primarily concerned with making sure that this church is able to be preserved for future inhabitants. And he's not going to let his work be sullied by a few misguided individuals who are warring over which one of them is more significant. So he has to cut through all the noise and get down to the heart of the matter of why they have been formed as a community in the first place and what is going to be required in order for them to stay in the community. So our thinking about this text because it has been largely relegated to the realm of weddings, is too small. 
And that's why this thrust is often lost on us, because we have been numbed into believing that it's the wedding passage. I don't even want to see a show of hands, but when Carol started reading it this morning, you probably all thought, oh, that's that one they always use at weddings. And you're like, I know this one, because I've heard it at weddings. And immediately, you, you just dismissed it, and you're like, I know this passage, and I know what it's all about. And I, I did too. <sighs> because taken out of context, it seems like it really works at a wedding, except for the fact that no one talks about tongues and prophecies usually in their marital life. And if you do, you need to see me after worship. <laughs> <laughs> now, verses 4 through 7, to be fair enough, I will admit that they can, they can be applied to a wedding without much fuss. But given Paul's intent, he is defining the greater gift that's needed to maintain the community, and any other application is secondary. To be sure, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. These are the attributes of Paul's more excellent way that preserves the community of faith. The kind of love that gets the individual out of their own way and leaves room for the community's growth. If our individuality, individuality and our persona and our flavor is going to get in the way of an impede, the greater workings of the church, Paul says, we need to check ourselves. We need to ask ourselves why we think uh, our worldview and our specificity is more important than the greater good of the institution. This is what he is asking for the community in Corinth. After a brief description of love, Paul returns to the matter of hand. So he moves from verses 4 through 7 where he actually has a very nice description of, of love in its highest sense, that selfless love, the agape love, the love that desires to give itself in order that the greater yield might benefit. But then he quickly resorts back to teaching about the matter at hand, which is the Corinthians are worried about emphasizing their own individuality over the good of the community. Picking up at verse 8, Paul writes, Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, that is the charismatic gift of speaking on tongues, will cease. And as far as knowledge, it too will come to an end. This is what Paul says here in verse 8. And why? Because we have limited spiritual knowledge. We have limited spiritual knowledge from our end. We only know in part and we prophesy only in part. Paul says this right here in verse 9. And in verse 10, he says, when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. What is the completion? The completion is when we pass from this existence, this physical existence, which we have come to know as life. When we pass from this realm, we go into that life that Jesus says has been prepared for us, which we can only intimate at. We have no idea what that realm is going to be like. We hope for that one. We long for that one. But we have no hard and fast definition of what that life to come is like. But then when that life does come for us, when we do inherit that new incarnation, that new realization, then everything that we did not know, everything that was diminished, the wisdom that we lacked on this side will be made known to us partial will now be complete. Now Paul imparts an example to the elders of the community, something that they will appreciate and relate to. And this is something that I think just anyone with any years of life can relate to. It starts at verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. As I think about it, Paul is in a not-so-subtle way telling the Corinthian church, telling the community of faith in Corinthians, stop acting like children. He says that it's time to stop being arrogant and rude and insisting on our own way. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, very plainly, it's time to grow. Because he sees that they are taking this precious message of Christ crucified, dead, risen, 
And they are now making it a contest of who can exhibit the character of Christ better than someone else. Who's more significant in the institution? Who should be the leader of this or, or that? And Paul's like, we are all equally necessary and important to the preservation of this community that we have formed. So he is telling them, stop allowing your love to hijack, or your understanding of a selfish love to hijack the greater work that God is trying to do in and through you. This is what he said to the Corinthian church. So Paul proceeds to close out this chapter by giving some assurance to the community. In verse 12 he says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. It's this verse that Laura had mentioned to me is one of her favorite in all of Scripture because there's that sense in which Paul recognizes that even from his limited capacity, even from his, his, his human weakness and his human frailty and his confusion, that even though he is not entirely sure about his own abilities and his capacities, and sometimes he doubts himself and second guesses himself, he has been known fully and entirely from the formation of his being until his last dying day by God. And that gives him assurance and comfort. And we may go through life and no one will truly ever understand us, but we gain confidence and we gain the assurance because we know that God does. And sometimes that's all we need to find a better conceit of ourselves, is to know that at least there's an entity out there that holds no bars against us, that does not say, oh, you're such a disappointment to me. Oh, if only you could have done this better. Oh, if you were only sharper, more attractive, a little bit more savvy at business. Only if you were something, 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 fill in the blank, something. God does not do that. God says, I know you fully, and you were loved just and so Paul takes comfort to this, and he passes this on to the community of Corinth, because he says, stop your squabbling. Stop your jockeying for positions. Stop the pull and push and the tug and the tug, because it is all given unto you by God. There's no one in that community that ranks any higher or more significant than anyone else. And Paul needs to, he, he needs to speak plainly to them so he can drive this point home. As human beings, we only know one side of our narrative. We know the life narrative. We know what it's like to be alive. We know what it's like to have our hearts broken. We know what it's like to, to truly celebrate and to be disappointed, to be misunderstood. We understand that. We have no idea of what God has in store for us when this is all over, but God does. And there will come a time when this world will pass away and we will know God fully. And all will be revealed to us. But until that time comes, that Paul leans on the understanding that he has already been fully known. And he passes that on to bolster their confidence and to bolster our confidence. So his final, his final verse, 13, 13 of chapter 13, he says here, he holds up three sacred precepts, and this is actually kind of a thing that runs through, through Paul's writing, especially in the Thessalonians. He holds up three faith precepts, faith, hope, and love, he says, and now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Now, he imparts that to the Corinthians because he wants them to have no misunderstanding, no cloudiness, no confusion as to what it is that's going to preserve their community, what's going to advance their position, and what's going to help them see one another as brothers and sisters in the faith. Now they have talent, he doesn't dismiss that. They have ability, he doesn't dismiss that. They have capacity, they are able, they have agency, they are able to make things happen. He doesn't dismiss any of that. He only dismisses how they are applying it. They are only applying it for the, for the express gain of a few individuals. They are only applying it for the elevation of themselves. And Paul says, that is where, that's where there's been the collapse. That's where the vacuum has been created. 
So he comes and he brings all understanding back to the collective and the wider good. That there really are only two relationships that we have in this world. For those of us who are people of faith, we have our relationship with God. We have our relationship with one another. And one has to inform the other. Right? That vertical relationship, which is, I don't know of a better way to describe that sort of vertical relationship of the spiritual relationship that we have with God. That has to inform our relationship perpendicular with, with one another. If it does not, communities that are designed to support and encourage and elevate one another will collapse, will dissolve, will become infected with ego, and we will not want to be a part of them because we get enough of that outside in the world and in the workplaces and in our schools and in our families. And we're like, you know what? If I want to be disrespected, I can go home for that. I can go to work for that. I can go and sit down and review with my employer if I want that. If I want to be elevated and I want to understand that I, that I stand as an equal with the person who's across the pews from me, I go to church for that. I go to church for the collective understanding that each and every person who is here belongs here, needs to be here, and is absolutely essential to the advancement of this gospel. But it is a shame that unfortunately our churches have missed to that point. So whoever's hearing 1 Corinthians 13 today and various houses of worship around the globe, may the thrust of Paul's intentions to bind the community together be not lost on any ears who have the power to hear these words. We join together in our responsive hymn, number 460.
brief glimpses of you break through during the week in times of great joy or more anguish. But you find us here today just as we are, and we ask that you would bless those who are sick and suffering, especially those who are on our prayer list, those who are having ongoing health conditions and concerns, those who are scheduled for upcoming treatments and procedures. Not only do we ask that you bless those whose health is being tended to, but that you would bless and sustain those who care for them. Only recently have we become, in the past few years, mindful of those who are in health care, both professionally, but also those who are caretakers in their own regard. And we now have we raised them to prominence to realize the absolutely indispensable role that they do play. One that we don't think about until we need it. As with most things, you never know what you need until you need it. But then when you do need it, you're so grateful that you are able to have it. So I ask that you would breathe new life and hope into those who are caring for those who are ill as much as I ask that you would guide those who are ill towards better health. That you would mend both bodies and minds because you can do that. And sometimes we don't ask you enough to do these things because we don't want to bother you. But you always seem to speak to us in the scriptures and say, please, no, bother me. I need to be bothered. So we thank you that your lines are always open to us. Be with those on the East Coast who are digging out so much snow. And for anyone who's still without power, help them to endure, keep everyone safe as they navigate their way through that rather intense blizzard. As you sent us here today, we offer to you our own prayers, regards. You give us strength. Bread for today, bread for the journey. Receive the prayers that we set before you today in your name. Giving you thanks and praise for receiving these, the prayers of your people, collect them into your care, strengthen and guide us as we praise one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the Lord of the
offered to you. We ask that you would bless and strengthen them, strengthen each and every one of us, that together we can continue sharing your light in the world. We covenant with the Lord and with one another, and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in his holy ways. We will strive to be doers of the word and not hearers only, to be firm in faith, quickened in hope, and constant in charity. And we will consecrate our time, talent, substance, and influence as a parent of God and joint parents with Christ. Whenever I flub that, I just let the congregation carry me. That's what we're supposed to do. Loving most merciful God, we thank you for the opportunity to come and reboot ourselves for the week that lies ahead. And to do so with the more opportunity for worship, it's always the way for special touch. For whatever we're going through right now, or wherever we find ourselves, whatever thoughts are swirling around in our head, or our desire to have warmer weather. We ask that you would meet us collectively at that altar and that you would forgive our childish notions in lieu of something a little bit more becoming of servants of God. But you'll forgive our times when we've done things our own way because that's how you do. So allow us to begin again and to be enriched by the opportunities to serve you and one another. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples. He took bread, blessed it, divided it, and says, this is my body. They shared the cup of the covenant. Christ's blood shed for the Loving God, thank you. Forgiveness, not something that we take for granted. When it comes from you, especially so, when we can exchange it and share it freely with one another, it just continues to drive home the incredible nature of your grace and how expansive it truly is. So help us to learn from you, from one another, and to teach teach forbearance, compassion, and to inhabit that love as Paul so uniquely defines in Corinthians. Our closing hymn is, hold on, wait for it, 377. <laughs>
Thank you. 